our video processing work, this is essentially what it was finding. It was building receptive fields that correspond to this layer. So first we learn simple features, then we learn combinations of those, and then layer that combination can detect something like a complex human motion. Right? So we know when, I, when you, people do things, you can understand what that action is. So this slide's kind of nice. It's kind of uh, wild, but it shows a lot of different applications um, and how all these things come together. And so on the math side, we have optimization, harmonic analysis, linear algebra. On the other side, from signal processing, we have work coming extended from wavelets and from signal transforms. And then sort of the other piece here, machine learning. Right? They used to, largely, this used to be called AI. People think too much of Terminator. So largely, the field has moved to calling things machine learning. But in a way, machine learning is independent, and it's, it's, it's an older subject. Um, so of the things that are interesting here, denoising, being able to take noise out of a signal, right? Say you had some, you've stuck your thumbprint on the front of your camera, and you got the best photo ever, but there's a thumbprint on it. How do you take that off? In painting, same sort of thing. We have, we're missing a piece of our photo. We want to restore it. CT reconstruction. We want to make sure that we give the lowest dose of x-rays possible. And so we can try to use these theories to reduce the imaging time. Super resolution, to actually zoom in and measure something beyond the diffraction limit. So this actually pushes physics, and you can, uh, in an amazing sense, zoom in past the bottom. And then there's all the others, like deep, uh, deep blurring, and then compressed sensing down here. So you can see there's anomaly detection. So this is very interesting in um, health applications. And so you could have a number of healthy versus unhealthy examples, and then an anomaly would be someone who's not healthy. So I like to, uh, to start with this work. This was really in, in, influential for me, uh, this project. This originally got started in 1988. It's called the Alvin Project from Carnegie Mellon. And I like this one because it's sort of in a very straightforward way, kind of breaks down a lot of the walls of these things. Like, what is all this neural stuff? Well, it's a thing that can write a program that's too difficult to program. And so I like this expression, problems too difficult to program by hand. <coughs> and driving a car was one of them. Writing, recognizing hand, handwritten digits was, was another one about the same time. Uh, the post office wanted a system that could read your zip code off the front of the letter. They hired a bunch of expert programmers to do this, but they couldn't do it. You cannot sit down and write rules about what a 7 looks like or a 2. You have to learn it. And so what they did is they took this uh, Army ambulance Humvee then they drove it down, and about every half a second or so, it took a picture of the road, and it recorded the steering wheel position. And so that would sort of tell people what the, the angle that it should have been. So ultimately, this thing learns a policy about what angle to set for each photo that comes in. And so this is very similar to how the Tesla drives itself. It's basically an extension of this work. So what is deep learning? How is this different than the other systems? I was saying you can't do a rule-based system. So if this might be hard to read in the back. It says rule-based system, classic machine learning, representation learning, and then deep learning. And so we can see it's basically all the same idea. We've just realized that the things are harder than we thought. And so it used to be people said, oh, we'll just think of stuff. I know. This is how a car works. This is what 7 looked like. It's called a hand design program. They fail miserably. Then people said, I know, we'll design features. We'll design, well, we know what we should look for, then we'll do that, and then we'll do machine learning. That doesn't work either. So then what you can do is you can say, oh, I know, we'll have the thing learn features, and then learn a mapping. This, learn, this works somewhat well. But really the big thing, the breakthrough, was just to add a few more layers where you learn simple features, and then combinations of those features, and then combinations and combinations, and so on. Some of the state-of-the-art systems now would have 150 or so layers here. But for uh, the video, we did a set of features, and then a combination of features, and then we learned the mapping. So 2011 was another big time. This, again, is the same lab as the, um, the one that did the brain segmentation. This, again, was one of these uh, sort of big moments. Not only was this six times better than the non-neural network method. It was three times better than the closest competition. And for the first time ever, ever, it was better than humans. And so the error rate, when you ask people to sit down and take a test, it's a very boring test, right? It's just European traffic signs. Um, uh, you know, most people get like less than half a percent wrong. 
right? So people do very well on this test. But nonetheless, for the first time ever, the computer was able to outperform humans on that in sort of a psychophysics domain. And so the error of their system was a half a percent. Humans got 1.16. Um, more recently than this, in 2013, and it's slightly more alarming, you say, well, who cares about this? You know, it's traffic signs, all right, that's neat and all. Since then, uh, they've applied this to drug discovery. And so there's a group out of Toronto who tried to do, essentially, you want to figure out what chemicals you put together to make a new drug. So the team that won, Uh, the team that won used a deep neural network approach, and the surprising thing is that no one on the team had any experience in medicine, pharmacology, or biology. No experience. There was another team, again, at the same group. They did a, a similar data set. This one out of Switzerland, where they did it for Chinese handwriting and for Arabic handwriting. Again, the team that won did not know Chinese. So this idea that you have to have domain knowledge to that's not going to be necessarily the case. So it's a very strange thing for science. Um, to see that this deep learning term, uh, you can see it was non-existent sort of in 2005. No one called it that. Um, and then it's just sort of exploded in interest. If you've seen the Sunday paper, you've probably seen deep learning. So amazingly, in 2012, Google had, they, this is the number of repositories for Google's internal code. How many projects internal to Google do they have that involve deep learning? 2012, it didn't really exist. But now we can see it's taken over basically every application at Google. Right? Everything they do, they've changed. They, they, the guy who was in charge of search itself, the actual search bar, he retired in the last two months. And they per took the person in neural networks and put him in charge of search. So it's taken over everything at Google. And so you think, well, this has been happening a long time. Right? I found this cool little bug back in 1925. So it's neat. You know, these things have been going a while. Let me turn this back on in case Howard has a question or something. Howard, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. I had a phone call that I No worries. And so we've kind of gone a long way to the, to, you know, we're getting to this little Wally type deal. And what's exciting about the algorithms that we're going to talk about is they're we call data agnostic. They don't care if you send it an image. They don't care if you send it a video. It doesn't know if you send it audio. Now, historically, in you know, the 90s or the 2000s, if you had said to somebody, hey, I need you to make me uh, you know, a video processing system. I need you to classify videos for me. But the, and then you know, a week before the project's done, they come and say, you know what? I needed to do audio, too. Can you classify audio samples? They'd say, that's a different team, different software. We're going to start from the beginning. What's exciting about this is because we've modeled it off the brain, it doesn't know. Neurons in your brain don't know if they're hooked up to what. And amazingly, there's been rewiring experiments where they can take ferrets and things, and they reconnect V1 to A1. They connect the eyes to the ears, the ears to the eyes. And amazingly, these animals can learn to see. If you take the optic input and you provide it to the auditory cortex, these animals can learn to see, which is very surprising. So let's talk about the sparse coding. I like this breakdown of imaging. Right, we say, well, what is imaging? Imaging is when we go from physics to an image. So we take something in the real world and we're going to turn it into a flat image. Image processing is when we sort of just take an image to an image, Photoshop kind of stuff, right? color enhancing, image enhancing. Computer graphics is when we take a series of symbols, a computer program, and then there's a set of rules that tells us how to create an image from that. So that's what video games are. Video games take zeros and ones and they turn them into some sort of reality from image. So computer vision can be thought of as the opposite of computer graphics. The idea is that you've taken an image and you want to output a symbol. And so the idea is that our brain, to, to some approximation, has to do computer vision in the sense that we're taking images and have to produce symbols. Why do we need symbols? Well, I have to create an action plan. And so I'll have to do reinforcement learning on this. <coughs> and so the whole idea is that at the end of the day, we're still going to have to do sort of reinforcement, Dr. Stackman style learning on these, on these symbols. Right. So what is sparse coding? We want to represent the most relevant visual information with the fewest possible resources. So that's really at the heart of complexity. When you think about what does it mean to, to measure the complexity, it's to measure the resources used. And so you have some sort of input, and you're going to want to represent it as some features. So you have some fixed set of signals, and then you're going to build a sum. This just means you're going to add up a bunch of these, how much of each one? That much of each one of those. And then now you'll reproduce your image. 
So you have some external world, it'll go through some model, and then you get some code out that we want to learn off of. So when people uh, actually measure simple cells uh, in cats, what we find is you sort of get a data, if you sort of uh, exaggerate the data, we can get approximate it that way. And we can see that this sort of looks for what was thought of as edges. And so in a sense, it now seems that maybe this idea of edge detection was a red herring. That for a long time, people said, oh, that's what it does, it's finding edges. And so people left that alone and they built edge detectors. They thought that's what the brain does, it finds edges. But it's really just a coincidence. It's a, it's a corollary of this general, more general idea of trying to build a sparse code. And it happens to be that the world is made of edges. Right? If you were to look in any part of the small piece of the world, it's either an edge or nothing. Right? If you look at a little small piece of the room. So we can take a small piece. Imagine, I like to take it, imagine you take a, a camera and you put it on like a, a golden retriever and you send it through the forest. Not like a photographer, but just like sort of random photos. Photography photos are too, they're too nice because someone put something important in the middle of the photo. But in general, imagine just taking random photos. And then you can take little patches of the photo. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a better way to represent this patch. So this is some kind of input, but your brain can't deal with all that, so it has to think of something simpler. So I like to think of it in terms of Netflix. If you're Netflix and you're watching a show that came out, Netflix has to send you all these pixels. You want to see all this. But Netflix doesn't actually want to send you all these squares. Right? So if this is 16 by 16, there'll be 256 little numbers to tell you how, how gray to put each square. And if you do that, then you'll have your TV show. But Netflix is like 40% of the internet or something already. So they have already have an enormous internet bill. They don't want to have to pay their bill as it is. So anything they can do that's cheaper, they'll do it. So one proposal you can think is sort of to motivate why the brain would do this, to imagine sort of a Netflix scenario, is that you have to get these frames to somebody. So instead of sending them 256 numbers, what you do is you have them download this set one time. Now they have this saved on their computer. And now you only need to tell them that number. You say, I need 0.8 of this one, 0.3 of this one, and 0.5 of that one. So now you have a recipe from known examples. These are pre-known examples. We sort of have these already on our computer. We can say, take that one, that one, that one, and we have a quick recipe that will make us this thing. And so this is the idea, is that we have a tremendous dimension reduction in the dimension. Here there's 64 elements. So we've reduced from 256 numbers to only 64 numbers. And so now I'm going to Morse code you this signal. I can, only, I can Morse code you now 64 numbers instead of 256. So you can save a lot of money. Or conversely, you think I'm putting something in a CT scanner. Now you've given them a lot less x-rays. So when they actually measure receptive fields, they look like this in animals. We can see mathematically they look like this. And so they sort of approximate each other. The same thing happens amazingly in A1. So now this is auditory cortex. Uh, they put little beads on cats' ears, on their cochlea. You can, you, know, you can do all kinds of amazing experiments about you know, me measuring the, the auditory response of cats and things. And people have done that. And amazingly, if you see um, the data in blue there and the model in red, you can see they're basically, uh, again, that we have this correspondence that it seems to be that there's some evidence that the auditory system is also applying a sparse coding on the inputs. So now just to motivate some compressed sensing work, I think these are just very exciting. This is not my work, uh, but I think these are just really interesting, so we decided to put them in. But this is the compressed sensing that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. And so basically what this is, is there's just been a revolution. And so basically everything we know about signal processing has gone out the window. Uh, Shannon and Nyquist said, that, oh, you have to take as many pixels as there are, as many samples as there are pixels. But for most images, they're not quite that interesting. They're not as interesting as they could be. And so they're much simpler than the space, that the dimension they're in. And so unbelievably, you're able to observe these pixels. You throw away 80% of the data, and it's able to recover to that. Um, the group that, that puts out this toolbox out of um, Georgia Tech calls this L1 magic. Right? So even the mathematicians themselves refer to this as magic. So, uh, yeah. if you could go back. Yeah, but so in that, that transformation, you're eliminating common elements, essentially? Um, to, to go from here to here? Yeah, or from 
the first image to the... Oh yeah, so from the first one, yeah, from the first one, it's just going to randomly go to pixels and throw them away. Right. So it's okay. this thing, it's just 20% it's just of this. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, then, and, then it, and then it tries to pull them back. And the okay. way it does that is try, it tries to build a dictionary. It tries to represent the noise with this, and then it replaces the noise with those, and then you essentially get it filled in, um, which, is, which is very exciting. And so this is, again, a lot of this stuff, it's going to seem like it's optics and signal processing, but really the, my point is that I would argue that the brain might or could be doing things like this. Uh, and if it, if it is, it would be extraordinary. Um, that we have this uh, incredible ability to denoise, right? If you have, like, imagine you're wearing dirty sunglasses and take them off and you didn't realize your sunglasses even had a smudge on them. Because your brain can just kind of subtract that out. Uh, like how we can't see our blind spot would be a perfect example. And so our blind spot, you know, sort of just fills in. Um, and so amazingly, you can do this with color. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, that there's even a picture in the middle, right? Especially on the projector hand. So this is why I was thinking you just need for historical records and all sorts of, you know, NASA and things, right? You get more data out of that. Um, uh, this is an example of in painting. And so they were able to remove the text. Now, if you were to ask me, you know, a few, a few, dozen, a few years ago, how could you accomplish something like this? We say, easy, you find an artist. And an artist will go through and they'll tell you what goes in those places that aren't stuff. But the fact that it was able to fill in the horse and the thing, it, it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, here it is in a zoom up, right? It, it, no one told it. There's no model of seagull or anything in here. Right? It doesn't know anything about anything about the world. So let's talk about these dictionaries and, and how we uh, can learn them. So to motivate this, we, we talk about um, classification. I, I thought at one point, you know, what is it that animals have to do? Well, they have to decide what to eat. And I thought, well, let's thought for something simple. Simple, you know, birds have to decide what they have to eat. And so you, their visual system would have to help them do that. Um, traditionally, when we think of a dictionary, the most famous dictionary is this one here, and this is called um, JPEG. And so when you send a JPEG image, you don't actually send all the numbers to somebody. You know, you squish your images. And so when you have, say you have a phone now, it has 12 megapixels. That's 12 million numbers. Now you take a picture with that camera, it's 12 million numbers. Because the first thing your, computer is gonna, your phone is going to do is throw away almost all that data. And so we want to look at how we can 